So today it's my pleasure to talk with Judy Illis. She's a professor of, of neurology and uh, distinguished pre professor of neuroethics at University of British Columbia. Uh, she is a leader in Canada in what has become uh, ever expanding, rapidly expanding field of neuroethics. That is how are decisions made on technologies, for example, uh, their application to humans. We're gonna talk about some of the technologies. We're gonna talk about things like access and health disparities and issues having to do with who gets access to newly emerging treatments or technologies and how decisions are made um, as to, to policy and, and how to manage these things because as you can imagine um, interventions that essentially modulate the mind, um, there's a lot of ethical implications. So Judy, um, let's talk a little bit about some specific areas of research. For example, genetic engineering is, is one big area and I know You've done some work with uh, indigenous people up in Canada. You're in Whistler now, lucky you. Uh, but I guess further north even, is that right? Where the indigenous people you work with? Yes. Yeah. Yeah, so, yeah, Mark, thanks for um, having me on, on your program. I'm excited to be here. Oh, so I just, let me just begin by, um, since you bring up my work with indigenous people, but even, even without reference to that work that I'll speak about, I want to acknowledge that uh, Neuroethics Canada that I direct here at the University of British Columbia is located on the unceded territories of the Musqueam, tsleil and Squamish First Nations people. And I really want to acknowledge the privilege of doing my neuroethics work and the work of my team on these beautiful lands and and uh, being able to benefit from all the knowledge that the elders and the peoples of those nations have um, shared with us over yeah, time. That's really important. Yeah. Um, and so, you know, you ask about uh, our um, uh, work with indigenous people. Um, it, this, uh, the original work that we did really didn't have to do with genetic engineering per se. It had to do with genetic testing. Yeah. Uh, and in that context, just sort of to briefly bring everybody on, on the same page about what that project was uh, in the mid 2000s, so around 2005, 2006, um, the gene for early onset Alzheimer's disease was discovered by investigators uh, in Vancouver, the University of British Columbia and colleagues uh, across Canada. And it's known as the PS1 gene, the pre one one gene. Um, and it is now known to be a dominant gene uh, that accounts or that underlies um, this terrible disorder that affects people really early in their adulthood. So at the late 40s, for example, early 50s, um, with no compromise to the longevity, to their uh, life longevity. So wow. they may live to 70 or 80. So it's a devastating disease that affects, in fact, uh, one in two people uh, in families. And in fact, if you have the gene uh, you will get this disorder. Um, and the question that was put in front of us is uh, now with the gene identified, why aren't uh, members of this First Nation and the, this courageous nation that collaborated so deeply with us is called the Taltan First Nation, located largely in Northern British Columbia, about 2000 kilometers, so 1800 miles from Vancouver. Um, why weren't they rushing to come to the urban centers for genetic testing? Um, and our job was to sort of apply an ethics lens to that question that was being asked by the clinicians and really puzzling the clinicians. And you know, the first question that we asked back was, well, what's the meaningfulness of uh, this disease to um, this, this large kindred? How do they frame it? How do they understand it? Um, what are their belief systems that underlie their knowledges about this disorder and affected people? And of course, why bother if there's no 
uh, clinical response to the disorder, uh, then why get on two small airplanes? One for sure is small from tiny and then to another airplane and come to be tested um, only to be known that you may or may not have a gene that um, is going to affect you or your family members. Um, the project um, uh, lasted for seven years and I, I, I'll just quickly say that it was one of the most meaningful projects of my life in that collaboratively we, did, we discovered that um, Alzheimer's disease can be framed in the context of wellness and using different belief systems and using an indigenous lens, we can talk about something called 2 I seeing is that it's possible for biomedical explanations of a disorder and traditional ones that have to do with, um, uh, you, you know, uh, beliefs around um, curses and hexes and being, mm -hmm you know, affected by um, traditional belief systems can coexist very meaningfully in the lives of people. And by putting the two together, bringing those knowledges together can really understand and benefit how people live together and support each other through this uh, terrible disease. Yeah, I'm very familiar with it. So we did a lot of work trying to understand how mutations in presenil and one amyloid precursor sure. protein lead to disease. We developed a number of mouse models and explored what's going on in the brain. And I know, I understand what you're saying, but until I started reading your work, I wasn't aware of that, that population up in Canada. I was aware down in Colombia, right. in South America, there's, and it's, what I'm getting from you, it's a similar thing where, you know, in theory, if you educate the families and particularly, uh, you know, young adults who are thinking about having children, they can say, well, there's a 50% chance of my child having this and they're going to turn out like, you know, one of my parents when they're in their 40s. And so they could decide, well, maybe we can adopt. There's also a technology, and, and again, with this group, it's the education part is difficult, I think, given all these historical uh, thoughts about these kinds of diseases, but um, it is possible to do uh, in vitro fertilization and embryo selection so that the, 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 the woman could ensure that her child does not have the mutant presenil in one in that case. That is possible with current technology, but um, you know it requires education and, and some ethic, ethical considerations. Um, so you know, I I, I think that uh, you know these technological possibilities are definitely evolving. Um, you know, they have to be um, meaningful and relevant to the people and the populations uh, about whom you know, we're, we're talking about. And um, none of that should occur without the engagement of the communities themselves. And, oh, and, of course. Yeah. Um, you know, and, I, and I think one of the, um, aside from the, the medical and health benefits that we shared uh, in, and knowledge that we shared in doing this project uh, together, it was the knowledge we gained about how um, uh, fractured intergenerational knowledge became because of children being taken away to residential schools and, oh. and so forth. And we actually produced um, for, for this uh, community, we produced jointly an illustrated, I'm gonna call it a comic book called um, The Mind Thief. So you can appreciate the title as it pertains to Alzheimer's disease. Yeah to close some of the gaps between the elders and the youth who, who were just starting to um, understand more about the disorder. Um, we don't deal with genetic engineering in this project or in these resources. It, it wasn't relevant to the project, but you know, certainly to other projects and other, other peoples in the context of the whole evolution of uh, neuro neuroscience and genetic en engineering, it's really relevant. But if I might, Mark, if you would allow me to um, plug my website, 
and, okay. and refer your, your readers and listeners to all the resources that we developed around this particular project. So sure. it's very easy to remember our website, it's neuroethicscanada.ca. Okay. And um, we have books that are freely downloadable for adults and kids uh, around early onset mind, uh, early onset Alzheimer's disease. We have some infographics and we also have a beautiful video that we shot uh, uh, on location uh, with our uh, Taltan collaborators. Yeah. So we're very proud of that. And I would invite everyone to um, who's listening and viewing to uh, have a look at some of those resources. There are other good things there about neuroethics as well, which hopefully I can uh, talk about as we go on with your program. And of course, these same kinds of ethical considerations apply to other inherited neurological disorders. There are Parkinson's disease, there's mutant genes, Huntington's disease, which is purely genetic and so on. And um, yeah, it's, it'll be interesting to see how this uh, evolves in terms of, because again, in, in theory, it is possible to eliminate these uh, across generations uh, in the future, um, but there has to be, you know, the people involved have to think this is a good idea and, and something they want to do. Right. Um, all right. So you've, so let's back way up. You didn't start out in neuroethics. You did some basic neuroscience research at Stanford, right? Your PhD was at Stanford? That's correct. Yeah, that's right. And, and what, what got you interested in neuroethics? Oh, you know, I, I love that question, Mark. Thank you for asking it. So I um, was always uh, very interested in the brain and behavior and did uh, some, uh, my PhD work indeed was on neurodegenerative diseases and how natural language production uh, actually is different among the, the three major, at the time, three major uh, neurodegenerative disorders, Parkinson's, Alzheimer's, and Huntington's. Oh. And um, we were seeing at the time, so this is a few decades ago, right? We, we have to say, um, the pencil and paper tests were very effective in depicting uh, the sort of dementia components oh, of yeah. these neurodegenerative disorders. And recall that this is enough decades ago that when I say pencil and paper, I mean literally pencil and paper. But um, I was really uh, taken aback that um, they weren't revealing how different uh, uh, language, the, the uh, devolution of language had to be given the way that the degenerative pathways um, are involved in these three different kinds of diseases. Of course, in Alzheimer's going from back to front, in um, Parkinson's starting the substantia nigra, Huntington's disease starting in uh, you know, motor areas and, and so forth. And so um, I, my studies had to do with just spontaneous language production. And in fact, we, sh we showed, um, my, my supervisors and I showed that in hunting to disease, when you just allow someone to speak freely, there's much more awareness about the language production and the gaps in language production and memory loss and word finding then meets, meets the eye or meets the ear. Um, and if you look at the patterns of successive corrections, for example, towards word finding, there's a lot of knowledge going on, even though it isn't apparent. Huh. And by contrast, in Parkinson's disease, language production kind of mimics what the motor component looks like. It's a, like almost a cogwheel effect, like it's hard to get started, uh, but then when yeah. you're going, you're going. So that was really interesting. Um, you know, to sort of dive deeper into those um, areas of interest, um, I started doing um, multi-channel EEG recordings in an organization called EEG Systems Laboratory, which was a self-standing research organization, not-for-profit, funded mm -hmm. by generous agencies like the NIH. And, um, you know, there we were further interested in, um, in uh, language processing, fatigue, uh, cognitive, you know, highly, you know, multi-second cognitive processes. And I, I think what I started to see through um, my behavioral work, my language work, my EEG work, and then I was present when functional MRI came online, 
um, where we were starting to be able to use MRI technology and make measurements of how the blood flows in the brain, specifically to different regions of the brain, depending on what a person is trying to do or doing, that, they, that technology was starting to un unveil, reveal, touch upon lives of people in very profound ways that would rapidly go outside the laboratory and into the home, the workplace, the classroom, the legal setting. And uh, there were a few of us who started to really feel that thinking about the ethical implications of these advances needed to start coming from within the neuroscience community and not just rely on our, you know, however brilliant uh, ph philosopher and legal scholars really on the outside of the field. Yeah. And um, uh, the work started at the University of Pennsylvania, uh, led by Art Kaplan, for example, and Paul Wolpe at the time. Martha Farrow was there. Steve Hyman was uh, at Harvard. Hank Greeley and I at, were at Stanford. And we started to engage in a discourse around what, what would um, you know, the ethics of neuroscience look like as driven by neuroscientists. Yeah. And that uh, led to the um, pioneering efforts to create this field called neuroethics. And we formalized it in 2001 um, at a meeting where UCSF and Stanford got together on the West Coast, the beautiful West Coast, uh, with uh, you know 100 people from different disciplines, including philosophers and legal scholars, but a lot of neuroscientists uh, supported by the Dana Foundation um, and all who came together to really think about this question, what, what does ethics in neuroscience look like from the inside out? And, and you had some representation from religious, religions or not? Because sometimes on the IRB internal review board, so for viewers and listeners who don't know, any research study involving humans has to be reviewed by a panel of experts. And... I, on, on, at, NI, at NIH, our internal review board had to have, if, if there was any, it seemed like we always had someone like a pastor or, or something just from the general community, but also kind of putting a perspective from religious beliefs onto the ethics. Yeah. Um, you know, Mark, I wish... <laughs> I could recall if we had uh, representation from the religious or spiritual world uh, at this meeting that we held in San Francisco. I honestly don't recall. Okay. Um, I would refer um, again in speaking to your viewers and listeners um, to a book that's available. It's actually a transcript of the meeting or a, oh. like a, a summary of the meeting. It was called Map Neuroethics, Mapping the Field. Uh, Marcus was the writer who pulled it together for us. Uh, it was published in 2002. It's available freely online at the Dana Foundation. Again, uh, Neuroethics, Mapping the Field, uh, Marcus as the author and um, you know, all the participants of the meeting will be listed there, as well as a summary of the sessions that we had and the conclusions that we uh, came to at the end of the meeting that actually form the foundation of this field that is now more than 20 years old. Yeah. So we're at 22 years now, and it is unbelievably exciting uh, where neuroethics has come today. It's in every neuroscience program, almost every neuroscience program around the world, Mark. It is at the core of the International Brain Initiative and Anchor International Brain Initiative, which the Canadian Brain Research Strategy that I co-lead is uh, one of the seven member nations and neuroethics is an anchor for us. And, you know, I'll tell you, I remember at the time, um, I was in radiology at the time at Stanford, uh, very much enjoying my imaging world uh, as, a, as a, a manager and a developer of research at the time. And my, my colleagues um, in neuroscience and radiology thinking that this neuroethics business was just crazy. <laughs> is that we, you know, we are ethical because we do research to benefit humankind. And um, this was just hugely risky and would never stick and so forth. And um, little by little through really rigorous 
empirical work, uh, partnership building, being very solution oriented and practical, we really have built a, a new field. Uh, it's not as old as chemistry that's been around six, <laughs> since uh, the 16 or 1700s, but um, you know, we'll get there, right? You have to start somewhere. Year one and year 20 are the beginnings of uh, 400 years. <laughs> So um, we're not going anywhere. <laughs> so, um, can you talk a little bit about some other technologies that are, there's a lot of money going into these things, um, brain implants, brain computer interfaces. You know, I think even um, Google and Elon Musk are involved in this. Oh, sure. Kind of thing, you yeah. know, um, you know, and, and it's always, Advances, I guess, start with imagination and sort of dreaming about possibilities, but at some point, uh, reality sets in and you have to have to consider the individuals, people involved and their families and whether there's differential access of rich versus poor, which is it's already a big problem, right? health disparities, and this is obviously going to also apply to kind of the cutting edge things that are coming out in the areas I mentioned. So you want to briefly talk about your thoughts on these um, technologies and where they're going yeah. in terms of, in ter from a neuroethical perspective? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So that is a loaded question mark. Um, okay. <laughs> let me let me think about where to begin. Okay. Uh, so a lot of my work is focused on the ethics of neurotechnologies today. I think that's because of my own interest in neurotechnology and imaging and so forth. Um, we are definitely seeing interest from the big companies in neurotechnologies, uh, both around imaging the brain. So that is, you know, pulling signals from the brain to understand uh, what a person, uh, you know, what, what parts of the brain are underlying maybe what a person is doing. Mm -hmm. People love to be able to record what people are thinking. There's some early work that suggests that aspects of thinking are possible. Um, although I, I will hold firm that we will never really be able to uh, ever monitor what somebody's thinking uh, if uh, that person doesn't allow the technology to do that, because uh, thinking and mind, what's going on in the mind there, is mysterious. There are, there are 100, billion, 100 billion neurons in the brain, nerve cells, and 100 trillion synaptic connections. Right. And we still don't even know how individual thoughts arise one thought you know, at the right. level of the, of the nerve cells. Um, and, but, you, you know, talking about interventions, and I see you did some work on epilepsy and the neuroethics, and that makes me think of Wilder, Wilder Penfield, right? Mm, Wilder Penfield. Wilder Penfield. A great who, Canadian. Great yeah. Canadian, very famous. And he would, uh, patients with epilepsy, Back then, they did a lot of surgeries to try to remove the reg region of brain tissue where all this aberrant activity is occurring. And while he was doing these surgeries, he would put stimulating electrodes in kind of different regions, or trying to find what region cut out. But And then these people were not under anesthesia, and they would like spontaneously say, oh, I just saw my wife come in or something. That, and that was the imaging, the brain imaging, it can tell you, oh, this brain region is active, but it doesn't really tell you at all what, what you know, thoughts or um, representations of things are actually encoded and stored there. Right. Yeah. Right. So, you know, I think that's so true. And, you know, we're so proud of our, Canadian history around leadership in neuroscience and, and neurotechnology. Um, I actually think Wilder Penfield was born in New York before he became Canadian, but uh. that's beside the point. But you know, it, in today's contemporary world, um, 
you know, I think we're, we're, we're faced with the challenges of big companies wanting to get into the mind reading and mind control business. Um, you know, I, I think science fiction is great. Um, all the power to these companies that have the resources to put uh, behind those kinds of um, those kinds of efforts. Like, who's going to push the innovation envelope if not companies that are, you know, super rich and and have no no holds barred? Um, but I think we have to remember that there is a futuristic. Uh, there's like the, the futuristic envelope, and then there's the envelope of today. And I think what's really important is that we don't let um, you know, the, the science of the future, uh, science fiction or science reality, whatever it may be, you know, interfere with our efforts to really help people today who are really suffering from brain and mental health disorders. Yeah, I agree. And so I think about people with, you know, depression and, and obsessive compulsive disorder, um, you know, young women with anorexia, nervosa, uh, you know, terrible eating disorder, um, th these individuals with, you know, mental health conditions um, are being tested today for technology that has been proven to be effective with Parkinson's disease. That is putting implants, brain, um, brain implants, electrodes deep into different areas of the brain to help curtail or suppress a brain activity that is leading to behaviors that really adversely affect people. Mm -hmm. um, clinical trials are going on the results you know vary from condition to condition these are very complicated conditions because no one is just their brain right um, each of us is us with our brains but in context of the whole world and people and resources and everything in in which we exist so you know our medical interventions can only do so much yeah um, but the hope there is tremendous um, you know, we also see, um, you know, we were talking about Parkinson's disease, helping, you know, the movement, the tremors that occurs with Par Parkinson's disease being helped by uh, these deep brain implants. Um, I have to make another plug for um, my work on epilepsy, um, because just tomorrow I'm uh, with my colleagues, I'm releasing a film called Seizing Hope, high tech oh. journeys into pediatric epilepsy. And this is a health documentary. The world premiere is tomorrow in Vancouver. You can find information about it online at seizinghopefilm.com. Um, and it's a film about four families with uh, kids and youth who have a drug resistant form of epilepsy. And it's all around the ethical decision-making that in which they've had to engage to decide about different kinds of neurotechnologies for their kids permanent implants, either to the big nerve in the back of the neck called the vagus nerve, hmm. deep into the brain, depending on different kinds of, um, a different form of epilepsy, electrodes that can be placed inside the brain for a week or two weeks to see where activity is actually uh, adverse and affecting the child. Um, and so it is a beautiful film. I, I'm it's a nail biting moment for us in neuroethics to uh, release this film tomorrow. We're gonna to be screening it all over North America. It's based on a four years of research funded by the NIH that we're very grateful for. And, um, you know, again, uh, what are the ethics around neurotechnologies? We can think about variables like how invasive is it? Can it be explanted? That is if you put it in and it doesn't work, or you put it into a wrong region, which doesn't usually happen, but nonetheless, could it come out? Could a child you know, grow out of their brain disorder and not need an implant anymore? Uh, yeah. What are the risks and benefits? What is the cosmetics of an implanted device look like? Is that important to a child or a youth or to a parent? What are the cost issues? Who can gain, who has access? Um, there are certain technologies. One of our families sought a technology called responsive neurostimulation that is only available in the, neuro, in the United States today, not in Canada. You know, why did a Canadian have to go to the US for um, a life-saving intervention? Um, one of our other families had to travel from one province in our country to another for a certain kind of imaging technology for her child. How is that possible? Why don't we have resources available to all people who who really disturb, you know, deserve 
equal access to healthcare under principles of um, human rights, uh, distributive justice, um, everyone's entitled. And then we loop back to, you know, access to healthcare really for all citizens, whether they live in urban areas, Mark, or whether they live in rural and remote areas, like the people we were speaking about early on in this program, yeah. uh, you know, who live far away from an urban health center. How, how can they gain access to technologies to which they are entitled and to which they contribute uh, through taxpaying dollars and so forth? And um, all these factors fall into the neuroethics space and um, that we we deal with on a daily basis, and and we hope to make a positive impact with. Can you talk? You've also done a lot of work related to trying to enhance the communication between scientists and the media. On the one hand, and as, as you know, and I think hopefully a lot of people know, the headlines of new findings that are in a newspaper or now on the internet. The headline often is um, greatly exaggerating what the actual uh, scientific advance uh, was and its implications. And this has been a, caused a lot of problems, I think, over the years. Because what happens is that, uh, you know, something comes out in the media, then people get a lot of hope, and then it turns out, you know, there was, way overblown and then it kind of retrogradely looks bad on the actual scientists when it was not necessarily them that were kind of misleading in the in the news articles yeah so you know it's it's a great question and you know this comes back again to balance and i think you know, some of the ethics for neurotechnology questions are questions of balance. And I think media reporting and science writing about advances in, in neuroscience and neurotechnology is also about balance. So on the one hand, um, journalists, and I, I have to say, I enjoy wonderful relationships with journalists all over the world today. Mm -hmm. I'm, I'm so gratified and I'm just gonna say immensely grateful for the work that good journalism does on behalf of the public yeah. and us in building trust between us, opening lines of communication that are beneficial and truthful and authentic and accurate. So um, I'm, I'm totally on board. Um, I, what I think we've seen is, and, and I think it's through the good work with journalists over the past 20 years or so, neuroethics people and, and others, um, in trying to ensure that journalists are able to attract the attention of the public and interested, affected people in certain topics. And you do that by headlines, right? In this busy world, which is, which is so crazy today in which we're bombarded by information from all sources, getting people's attention is hard. And so a good headline is really important to draw people in. Um, and, but then I think, um, you know, what, what goes from a good headline is um, authenticity of reporting. And that authenticity is really defined by um, providing most importantly, balanced reporting about uh, both results of certain studies, as well as the promises of those results and the limitations. And we, I think have seen, I, I believe, and I don't have an empirical study to put on the table for you, but I certainly have experienced and seen much more balanced reporting in neuroscience uh, in the past 20 years than I think existed before. And again, I'm, I'm deeply grateful for that. And I think it, it arises from the goodwill really of all stakeholders in this story. Scientists who, and ethicists who are pushing stories out and journalists who are doing an ever better job of reporting it out to the public. And at the core of that goodwill is trust. And that's trust in a triangle between scientists, journalists, and, and the public. Yeah. And you know, we also know that the public is the public's opinion is super important in shaping public policy. Yeah. So if the public has a distorted opinion or understanding of something, 
public policy is not going to go the good way. And um, for, you know, for all reasons that are so obvious, efficiency, cost savings, access, um, we all need to be better connected. And we have definitely gone down that road. And this, you know, as you know, initially when the internet came online, you know, it was great. You can get a lot of information quickly. And in the early days, I think a much significantly higher proportion of information was good information. But now, you know, there's a big problem with misinformation and and the the um, algorithms, you know, Google and so on, bouncing back and kind of trying to almost amplify uh, amplify discord, but in some ways, and unfortunately, amplify misinformation. Um, and then, you know, people get in these bubbles where they're start to believe a lot of misinformation and because the, the algorithms are pushing things to them that are from the same uh, wrong view, it's cr creating a big problem. Yeah, so I want to be careful, okay. uh, Mark, not to impugn uh, Google or Facebook. Yeah, yeah. Um, there, there definitely uh, are some practices that I I don't embrace or sure. Uh, uh, well, I'll just I'll just stop there. But I will disagree with you on one point, okay. which is I think when the internet came came into our lives. We actually, in at least in the health arena, I'm not talking about political messages, right? We're just talking about health now. Okay. Um, we do know in almost every neurologic and mental health condition that we've looked at, the first place that people went to was the internet for information. Um, and early on, um, we saw a many, many like random websites containing testimonies and personal oh accounts and actually bad information, misinformation. Mm -hmm. um, and you know our studies and, and other studies by, by ethicists and uh, public health scholars really showed um, showed and identified um, bad websites or, or features of websites that were, I'm going to say less good than others. I, I had it's I had one website <laughs> I went to, PubMed. that was it. <laughs> Yeah, well, PubMed yeah. is a good one. Yeah. Um, you know, many of the hospitals uh, and the NIH, of course, puts out, you know, very, yeah. very authentic information. Mail and clinic so I, and so on. Yeah, and, yeah, absolutely. And so I think where there isn't a financial interest on behalf of yes. the website yes. holder yes. and no conflict of interest, we know those sites tend to be uh, really quite good. Yeah. And where, you know, a viewer or a searcher might find a website um, that has a commercial interest. Um, I, th I think what we've shown is that it's important to, you know, uh, ask multiple questions about the veracity of information there. Yeah. And I, I feel as though there's um, the health information that's online is actually be better than it was originally, okay. not worse. Now, you know, you raised questions about political messages, fake news, misinformation. There is a lot of that. Um, but I think it's in a, a different okay. category that I, I don't think is in the scope of this conversation. That's very important. Well, to I'm, you know, I'm thinking about the COVID and the vaccine misinformation. There was, at least on our side of the border, um, you know, this kind of amplification of the vaccine is going to hurt you and or you don't need the vaccine. And, and that. Yeah. so that, I was... That's a recent case where there was some issues, at least down here. Yeah. So, you know, while while I think it's important to respect all views that come to the table, I think ultimately people's actions should be based on science and right. evidence, not on um, belief systems. Yeah. And um, where science and evidence support, for example, the beneficial effects of vaccines or masking or um, uh, you know, I you know, isolation for the time that we needed it. I, I think that's what should drive people's decision making. Yeah. 
Now, you mentioned um, um, institution industries that are money-making industries, and two that come to mind are the pharmaceutical in industry uh, and also the food industry, processed food. And, you know, in my mind, there's some serious problems in both in terms of uh, money driving decisions. You, I, you know, uh, the FDA approved, this is one example some people may have heard of in relation to Alzheimer's disease. They approved a treatment, which is a monoclonal antibody against the amyloid protein that the clinical trial data when it was looked at by the experts on the panel, didn't really look like it, it helped the patients at all, but the FDA approved it, you know? And <clears throat> this is one area where my son worked at the FDA for a couple of years as a post -bac fellow after he got his bachelor's degree, he worked in a lab there. And I went to visit him, visit there. And in contrast to our laboratories and buildings, uh, you know, either in Bethesda or in Baltimore, NIH, which are just kind of um, plain. Down there, they have marble hallways and so on. So the FDA actually gets money from the pharmaceutical industry. So I, I view that as kind of a big conflict of interest. I don't know what you're thinking on that. Is. So I, I don't think I want to. Um... Yeah. Uh, go down the path of um, the, the FDA is in your country, not my country. I think mm -hmm. Health Canada doesn't okay, have well, well, we'll mar leave marble hall hallways. <laughs> but but I'm going to take the opportunity uh, to uh, take you down a, a different path that's related to um, uh, that's related to your question, maybe okay. if not directly on your question. Um, and that's the case of um, where I think we need to do a lot of work with the FDA and with Health Canada and other agencies that um, are in the business of regulation and uh, regulation of products that fall, that are now being classified as wellness products and that actually yeah. don't need approvals by regulatory um, agencies, uh, unlike health products. Yeah. So, um, and I think of neuro wearables today um, and these are devices. So we're going back to neurotechnology and taking yeah. you back to neurotechnology, which is my domain. Yeah, hook, um, a and, hook a battery to your head. and Hook a battery <laughs> to your head. There you go. You can hook a nine volt battery and buzz yourself, or you can buy uh, a, a gadget off the shelves in a big box store and, you know, use the signals that it produces to help you re relax or, uh, you know, focus better and so forth. Um, and so, you know, many of some of these devices are really going down a path of really evidence-based developments and innovation with truthful messaging. And they really might hold some great promise for, for people um, uh, in the wellness category. So wellness uh, does not include any disease type words like anxiety or depression or post-traumatic stress disorder. Wellness includes sleep, although not sleep disorder, concentration, mood, although not depression. And, um, you know, our work has shown that uh, neuro wearable companies really need to be doing a better job about being clear about their claims of benefit yeah. and what the limitations are uh, of the benefit and where the evidence is about, you know, what, they're, what these devices are able to do at, at present. And um, we, we do, um, uh, we have encouraged in our writings and our research that uh, neuro wearable companies should absolutely explicitly discourage people from adopting their devices instead of uh, conventional therapeutic intervention like psychological services when somebody is, um, you know, having trouble focusing or having, you know, mood shifts and, and so forth. And that's especially important in the time of COVID when so many people have been affected by, um, by being isolated and not being connected with other people. And we really have urged explicit messaging about using these devices in addition to, uh, you know, other conventional services. But going back to regulation, 
we do feel that some of the claims of these of industries that are developing these devices, these neural wearable devices that are entirely non-invasive are really on the border with, if not actually crossing into the health sector. And we have urged regulatory agencies around the world to start looking at them, to redefine concepts of wellness and where uh, certain concepts really need to be brought into the health category and regulated. And we would also love to see a better harmonization of rules and regulations around health products across international regulatory agencies so that the messages that the public get gets and users who are interested in these kinds of technologies and, you know, in our first world, everyone's seeing them everywhere whether they're on the internet or on billboards on the highway. Um, I think we think adopting a common language will really um, bring everybody on board on the same page, both the, the developers and the public. And uh, you know, we've gotten together under the, um, uh, the leadership of the Office of Economic Growth and Development, the OECD, to talk about responsible innovation in neurotechnology and neuroscience. And I think that was a great start. It was pre-COVID and uh, we're picking up, you know, we're continuing to carry that ball and, and continue that conversation. And so uh, the messages there are, uh, we need to redefine wellness and bring over concepts into the health category where they belong. And we need some consistent messaging across agencies. Uh, I think for pub better public understanding and public trust. Yeah, that's great. Uh, it's absolutely true. It's a lot of work. You've got a lot of work ahead of you. Not going anywhere. No. <laughs> um, one other thing, you know, so you mentioned depression several times, uh, which is a big problem. And what's your take on psychedelics? I, you know, there are, my understanding, there are multiple companies, startup companies now that are essentially focusing on psychedelics uh, for treatment and what's the what's I guess what's the uh, so marijuana is legal now in Canada true for recreational uses yes and what about psychedelics uh, I don't believe it there it's Mushroom, legal yeah no no but they've you know there's been multiple clinical trials mm -hmm. showing quite impressive results in people with severe depression. Um, and it, it's, I think, a really interesting area. Um, well, why would we be surprised? Indigenous people have been using psychedelics yeah. since time memorial. Yeah, that's right. Um, and so the colonialists and settlers suppressed it for whatever reasons motivated them to do that and motivated lots of other that's things right. that they, they did that were not necessarily Absolutely. beneficial for people. But I think bringing it back uh, needs to happen through proper sure. uh, scientific and clinical trials and oversight. You know, you mentioned um, institutional review boards or so ethics review boards yes. to ensure that studies are done properly. Yeah. People are protected. No one is coerced into a study they don't want to be in and that benefits are always maximized over, over risks. That's, they're moving to legalization in that Washington DC has legalized psilocybin, magic mushrooms. And the, my understanding is the state of Oregon is, uh, you know, I guess they made it, de they decriminalized it. So um, I, I, I'm thinking it won't be long and these are <laughs> a lot of people <laughs> be using yeah. it, so yeah. Um, so then I, I it gets, yeah. <laughs> you know, but, there's certain, we're seeing a lot of interesting new, new and old movements in the United States in, in your country. Um, yeah. yeah. That, of course, are, are dividing your population tremendously and um, all, all need proper attention by well meaning people, both uh, in you know, the, the public community and, and the community of, of scholars. Yeah. Not to provide yeah, and this, this is a good example of why it's very important for 
scientists and the regulatory to really communicate to the public better. Oh, absolutely. Um, it's, it's really critical. Um, yeah. Uh, okay, we're getting close to the end of the time now. And I guess one final thing is that you mentioned children with epilepsy. That, that doesn't respond to drugs, and that's a, a terrible situation. There are a lot of, there are many disorders in children that cause a lot of problems. Cerebral palsy, uh, Down syndrome, autism, autism spectrum disorders. And so I think this is a very important area of, is ethics of, of of helping children and helping their parents. Um, you know, and then when you get to treatments, obviously, in many cases, these kids are too young to give formal consent. And so their, their parent is having to make a decision about some treatment uh, and whether to have their child do that. And I think that whole area is a very important thing for children. I, we've done a lot of work on um, how exercise and fasting affect their brain. And um, childhood obesity is a big problem. And it actually, there's really strong evidence now that children with obesity, they perform more poorly in school and, you know, some people might say, well, that has to do with their perception of themselves and so on. But there's actually studies showing that on average, these children with obesity have smaller hippocampus, brain region, very important for learning and memory. So lack of exercise, uh, excessive calorie intake, it's not only bad for adults, it's very bad for kids. And, so there, um, I think neuroethics is important. How, how do we, one, educate, the, educate parents, and, and two, help the parents interact with the schools and so on, uh, you know, to help their child not only have more general health, but better brain health and therefore uh, reach their their potential. Yeah. You know, it's another great question. Thank you. So a uh, couple of things, three things. I hope I remember them all at this point. <laughs> One um, is that the Canadian Academy of Health Sciences just came, just published a freely available, available online, uh, what we call an assessment in Canada, but a report on autism. And I really, um, it's available online. The Canadian Academy of Health Sciences uh, was just published a few months ago. It's really, it's, it's a marvelous modern view on autism with a lot of engagement from people from the autism community. And I really, I invite everyone to, to have a look at it. Uh, number one. Number two, um, so much of my, my work today uh, is to translate the work that I and others do in the laboratory to the public. And, you know, an example of that is taking the time with you today to, to speak about so many interesting issues, um, to release seizinghopefilm.com, the film Seizing Hope tomorrow to the public, and then screen it all over the world. Um, you know, we have found in neuroethics, um, and in fact, we found in neuroethics the importance of outreach but in fact, outreach and education and capacity building was one of the four pillars that we identified all the way back in early 2000 at that mapping the field meeting that we held. So looping back to the beginning of this conversation, like it all, <laughs> it all fits together as a tightly knit jigsaw puzzle. Yeah. And so it's essential that we do that, you know, just keep buried, keeping our heads buried in our laboratories. I don't think even people who are working in the cellular biology field in neuroscience, cellular neurobiology should do that. We all need to communicate what yeah. we're doing and why we're doing it. Yeah. Think about how we're gonna disseminate our results and what the implications are for everyone who will receive them. Yes. A final point though, and maybe it's a nice one to end on, 
is I'm just coming out with a new edited book volume and it's on neurodivergence and neuroarchitecture. Um, and with colleagues in Australia, they um, uh, have, a, in, it's, so the volume is called Developments in Neuroethics and Bioethics. And this okay. is volume five, Neurodivergence and Neuroarchitecture. And it's somewhere upwards of a dozen chapters, all written, almost all written by people from neurodiverse communities speaking about the importance of the design of space and architecture huh. that promotes well-being, thriving, uh, the special attributes of people with um, neurodiverse brains and how important that is to not only be inclusive of people with neurodi neurodiverse perspectives or, or um, brains, but actually being integrative and using all that we know about how different brains can be to build better spaces that allow people to be well and happy and productive. Interesting. Yeah, that's that's fantastic. And I'll on the YouTube channel, I'll put up links to all of these uh, uh, things you've told me about throughout, throughout our conversation. Great. So Judy, I'll I'll let you go. I know you have to have something else coming up now, and I've enjoyed learning from you about neuroethics. You know, I was buried in the, as a lot of scientists, buried in my work and specific areas and really didn't think much about neuroethics. I, I think that's true, but, but now they do have, a, like Johns Hopkins, where I'm at now, they do have uh, some training in, in neuroethics for their neuroscience uh, graduate program and I think other programs. So I think that is rapidly expanding, educating uh, people you know, from budding neuroscientists from er an early part of their, their trajectory about neuroethics so that they can always kind of keep this in mind as they're going through the, the daily grind in the laboratory. Yeah. So, you know, I've enjoyed this conversation immensely with you. Um, I invite your listeners to read, to look at my website, neuroethicscanada.ca, to reach out to me with any questions. And um, I really applaud your efforts, Mark. Thank you so much for including me in your program and taking the time with me. Okay, Judy, uh, have a great rest of the summer. Thank you. Okay, bye.